Hello friends, have you ever thought about the poets who wrote when the influence of poets such as Dryden and Pope was declining and poets such as Wordsworth, Coleridge, Safi were yet to appear on the literary horizon of English poetry. Today I am going to tell you something about these poets. The major poets, the major transition poets were Thomas Gray, you must have read his famous poem called Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard. <coughs> Oliver Goldsmith, the author of The Deserted Village and The Traveller. William Cooper, the shy and timid, morose poet, Oliver, Oliver Goldsmith I have already pointed out to you, Robert Burns and William Blake. <coughs> Robert Burns and William Blake are major figures and we would talk to them on some other occasion. But there were a number of poets, for instance, those who were called the graveyard school of poets, people such as Parnell who wrote Night Peace on Death. Edward Young, who wrote Night Thoughts, Robert Blair, who wrote The Grave, and Gray, as I have already said, Elegy Written in a Country Churchyard. All these poets wrote melancholic, reflective poems set against the background of the graveyard. Besides the graveyard school of poets, a small bunch of poetry, there were major minor poets such as James Thompson, the author of The Seasons, William Collins, George Crabbe, James Macpherson, Thomas Chatterton and Thomas Percy. We hope that you would be able to assess and see the influence of some of these poets on the major romantic poets such as William Wordsworth, Coleridge, Sati, Byron, Shelley and Keats. What were the influences that you find on these poets of the transition period? What were the new trends that you discover in these transition poets? Some of them wrote in the poetic style of the neoclassical age, in the style 
of Dryden and Pope. For instance, Oliver Goldsmith writes in heroic couplets. But there were others who tried new forms of verse in their poetry, such as Thomas Gray and all, all the poets, in fact, that I have named just now. Besides the literary form, the, ab the gradual abandoning of the heroic couplet, you find an emphasis on individual expression. They were not trying to say what oft was thought but never so well expressed. They were trying to look within themselves and write about their own feelings and impressions and experiences, their sorrows, their joys, their hopes, their ambitions. These poets were also ones who, who wanted to revive the old medieval age which the neoclassicists had done everything to abandon. Pope found the medieval era uncouth, lacking in clarity, dark, uncivilized. The transition poets began to see new virtues in the medieval age, in the Norse saga, in the poetry of Scotland and Wales. Besides the gradual shifting from the heroic couplet to other forms of verse and looking for new subjects in the medieval age, in the less from the English point of view, civilized societies such as the Scandinavian countries, especially Norway, and nearer home in Scotland and Wales. They looked for new subjects in their own society the parson, the village school master, were subjects of interest for Oliver Goldsmith, whereas Pope was interested in the lives of earls and dukes. in great subjects. The transition poets began to write about their own experiences. As I have pointed out, the graveyard school of poets wrote about their experiences against the background of the graveyard. And 
for models the transition poets looked for experiences sentiments ways of expression in poets such as spencer shakespeare and milton these were the guiding factors so were, if we can say so for the transition poets most of the transition poets were also very melancholic in temperament dryden was not melancholic he was satirical in his poetry pope was not melancholic if you remember lines from the rape of the lock or the epistle to dr arbuthnot you feel that there is so much confidence so much a feeling of the poet's own superiority over others that there was no question of melancholy in their poetry rarely do you find self pity in dryden sometimes in pope but even that is a poetic posture more than a genuine expression of self pity when exactly did what we call the transition poetry begin literary experiences are not like historical events for which we can put a date as life changes as we begin to think in new ways we also begin to express ourselves in new ways the life around us changes our experience and this change in experience is reflected in the literature especially poetry of the period we have always we have frequently talked about the happy marriage the happy blending of the milieu the man and the moment in literature and if we try to see and try to read the poetry of this period the transition period we find that we can gather a rich harvest of poetic experience from this period thomas gray he was who was born in 1716 and died in 1771 is a major transition poet we know him for his elegy written in a country churchyard in case you have forgotten some of his lines i'll try to read out a few of them the curfew tolls the knell of parting day the lowing herd winds slowly o'er the lea the plowman homeward plods his weary way and leaves the world to darkness and to me now fades the glimmering landscape on the sight and all the air a solemn stillness holds save where the beetle wheels his droning flight 
and drowsy tinklings lull the distant folds. Save that from yonder ivy mantled tower, the moping owl does to the moon complain of such as wandering near her secret bower, molest her ancient solitary reign. Beneath those rugged elms that yew trees shade, where heaves the turf in many a mouldering heap, each in his narrow cell for ever laid, the rude forefathers of the hamlet sleep. Here you find that the poet is still influenced to some extent by the neoclassical age. There is a certain kind of mannerism. When you go to the bard, it is about the poets who had been killed by one Edward, Edward I, who lived from 1239 to 1307, has also been called the Hammer of the Scots. He succeeded in conquering Wales. And he has been cursed by the poet, the minstrel, the Welsh minstrel, for whom this poet, poem was written. The bard is called a Pindaric ode. Pindar, I may remind you, was a 6th century BC, before the Christian era. Pindar was a Greek poet of the 6th century before the Christian era. He wrote about Olympian heroes in a very intricate form of verse, a very well planned poems. And these lyrics, because of their formal style, got the name of Pindaric Odes. Dryden was one of the writers of Pindaric Odes. Pindaric Odes were written even by the poets in the Romantic Revival period. So here is the Welsh poet, probably the last of his clan, cursing the king, cursing Edward I who ruled over England from 1239 to 1307. Ruin seize thee, ruthless king, confusion on thy banners wait, though fanned by conquest's crimson wing, they mock the air with idle state. Helm nor hauberk's twisted mail. Notice how The poet gives a medieval atmosphere to his poem when he remembers the hauberk, the twisted mail of a medieval soldier. They mock the air with idle state, held nor hauberk's twisted mail nor e'en thy virtues tyrant shall avail to save thy secret soul from nightly fears, from Cambria's curse, from Cambria, Cambria's tears. Cambria is Wales. From Cambria's curse, from Cambria's tears. Such were the sounds that o'er the crested pride of the first Edward scattered wild dismay as down the steep of Snowdon's shaggy side Snowdon is the mountain in Wales as down the steep of Snowdon's shaggy side he went with toilsome march his long array stout Gloucester stood aghast in speechless trance 
To arms cried Mortiper and couched his quivering lance. Here, the prime challenged by a poet who is armless, who has only his poetry to save him. And so, the king's men, Gloucester and Mortimer, ask for arms to kill one more poet of Wales, of Cambria. On a rock whose haughty brow frowns o'er old Conway's foaming flood, robed in the sable garb of woe, sable is dark, robed in the side by falling from the uh, crag, from the steep rock into the flood of the river beneath. The verse adorn again, fierce war and faithful love. These are the two subjects of poetry, love and war. Virgil opened his Aeneid with, of arms and men, men I sing. Here you have Thomas Gray placing himself in the great tradition of European poetry. The verse adorn again, fierce war and faithful love, and truth severe by fairy fiction dressed, in buskin measures move, pale grief and pleasing pain, with horror, tyrant of the throbbing breast, a voice as of the cherub choir, gales from blooming Eden bare, and distant, distant warblings lessen on my ear, that lost in long futurity expire. Fond impious man, thinks thou use yon sanguine cloud, raised by the breath has quenched the orb of day? Tomorrow he repairs the golden flood, and warms the nations with redoubled ray. Enough for me, with joy I see, the different doom our fates assign. Be thine despair and sceptred care, to triumph and to die for our mine to triumph and to die are mine. Be thine despair and sceptred care. The king holds the sceptre, but he also holds care, worries, anxieties, fears. And he says, the different doom our fates assign, be thine despair and sceptred care. To, to triumph and to die are mine. The poet is free, even in his death. To be thine despair and sceptred care, to triumph and to die are mine. And then Gray narrates, he spoke and headlong from the mountain's height, he spoke and headlong from the mountain's height, deep in the roaring tide he plunged to endless night. This is the type of poetry that Wordsworth read when he was young and was influenced by. Thomas Gray, if you want to understand the spirit of the age, you may read some of his travelogues. While at Cambridge, he was, he was a student of Peterhouse, Cambridge. It's one of the oldest colleges of Cambridge University. And there, he was a friend of Richard West, who died much before Gray. And Gray did him the honor of remembering him is in one of his sonnets. Richard West was one of his friends and so was Horace Walpole. Horace Walpole, I may remind you, was son of Sir Robert Walpole, who had been Prime Minister of England. In fact, he is considered the first Prime Minister of England. 
Horace Walpole inherited huge wealth from his father and went on to build his castle called which he named Strawberry Hill. He had a printing press there and the bard and another poem called The Progress of Poesy, the two Pindaric Odes were published by Horace Walpole in 1757 at Strawberry Hill. These two poems, The Progress of Poesy and The Bard, were so popular that when Cole Sibber died in 1757, Cole Sibber was a poet laureate, and when he vacated that chair by his decease, Gray was offered the position of poet laureate, which he de declined to accept. Gray was a scholar and he stayed quietly at Pembroke College, Cambridge, where he died in 1771. Thomas Gray had a very painful childhood. He was the only child of twelve, one of, one of the twelve to survive infancy. His father was a tyrant. His mother died when he was young. And the result was that Gray became a very unhappy poet all his life. He, one of his early poems is Hymn to Adversity. Another poem was On a Distant Prospect of Eton College. You may have read Ode on the Death of a Favorite Cat, which was published in 1748. Gray is always melancholy and in the 18th century we can say that he was one of the first to read nature. If you want to understand the difference between the Augustan age, that is the age of people like Dryden and Pope, people like Addison and Steele and Swift, from the poets of the transition period. Some historians of literature have called the transition poet the poets of the Romantic Revival, which is not an inapt description. Though, the, in, though it is the convention to call these poets the transition poet. So, you have Thomas Gray, a poor scholar who became a friend of Horace Walpole, son of a very rich father who wanted to be as famous as his father, not by gaining political power, but through his achievements by writing. You remember the novel, called, the Gothic novel called The Castle of Otranto. Horace Walpole wrote this novel. You find a medieval strain in Horace Walpole's life 
and his writings. Horace Walpole took Gray on a tour of the cont continent. If you read 18th century literature, you would find that the grand tour was a favorite theme of poets and more than poets, gentlemen in that age. They traveled from France to Italy and on the way they crossed the Alps and many writers of the 18th century have written about these journeys, Fielding, Smollett, Addison, Gray, Horace Walpole and many others in fact. I was trying to tell you that if you wanted to understand the difference between the writers, the two mindset, you could place Addison by the side of Gray and thus understand the difference in the tone, in the temper, in the spirit of the Augustan age from the poets of the Romantic Revival, poets of the early Romantic Revival such as Gray. Addison crossed the Alps in good weather and still he writes, a very troublesome journey. You cannot imagine how I am pleased with the sight of a plain. Here is a man who values his urbanity. The mountains don't offer sociability. The mountains offer scenes of wilderness that can sometimes affright you. They describe the precipices. Addison does not very much appreciate the Alps. He says, a very troublesome journey. You ca cannot imagine how I am pleased with the sight of a plain. Gray, on the other hand, crossed the mountains in the beginning of winter, late in autumn, wrapped, as he himself says, and I quote, wrapped in muffs, hoods, and masks of beaver fur, boots, and bearskin. And still, he says, not a precipice, not a torrent, not a cliff, but is pregnant with religion and poetry. This is the difference between the Augustan age, the age that valued clarity, urbanity, sociableness, precision, accuracy, from the poetry of early re Romantic Revival, which valued emotion, mystery, grandeur, sublimity that you find in a poem such as The Bard by Thomas Gray. Gray writes, and I would repeat, not a precipice, not a torrent, not a cliff, but is pregnant with religion and poetry. He sees something valuable, something deeply, as Wordsworth would say, far more deeply interfused, 
some mystery in objects of nature, in precipices, in torrents, in rivers, in hills, in mountains, which were grand and sublime. Now let us turn to a poet such as Oliver Goldsmith. Oliver Goldsmith was an Irishman. He created the impression of someone very careless and carefree. He entered Dublin University as a Caesar. A Caesar was a person who had to work in lieu of the tuition that he received from the university, which means he did not have to pay the tuition fee of Dublin University, where he was a student. So Oliver Goldsmith was a Caesar at Dublin University, but he did not continue his studies there, and he wanted to go to America. So his family collected a small fund for him, gave him a horse, and sent him to Cork, from where he was to board a ship for America. Oliver Goldsmith spent the money at times he also wrote a few poems for the wayside poets who earned their living by singing by reciting those poems to travelers but he spent them, spent whatever he earned on the poor people he saw around him. And having spent all the money, he came back home to palace where he was born. On the way, he exchanged his horse for another one called Fiddleback, which was a nag, a poor quality horse. Then his family members wanted to send him to London so that he would make a man of himself. They collected 50 pounds and Oliver Goldsmith squandered the entire amount on cards. Then his family members tried to send him to Edinburgh. This time Oliver Goldsmith went to Edinburgh. <coughs> he stayed there for two years. He was there at the medical school. He loved to sing songs and tell tales. That was what he was known at Edinburgh for, at the medical school. Another Munna Bhai. But then he discovered that he was not learning much at the medical school. So this Munna Bhai decided to go to the continent and earn a degree there. He went to Padua, Louvain, Leiden, but without earning a degree, he came back to London, settled at Sadark to practice as a physician 
from whatever knowledge he had gained at Edinburgh and at Louvain. It was then that he came, he got to know Samuel Johnson and there he began to earn some money. Goldsmith was not only careless and carefree, he was also pompous and he dressed himself in velvet, he adorned his house and in poverty he soon began to discover the, that he had not much to live by. However, in Samuel Johnson's circle, he began to thrive and died there. Johnson praised him for having nothing of the bear but his skin. I would repeat, Goldsmith had nothing of the bear but his skin which meant that it was only externally that he was rough, otherwise at heart he was a very great man. Perhaps this is true. How did Johnson discover Oliver Goldsmith? Goldsmith wrote for the public ledger, a journal, and the series of essays that he wrote were called citizen of the world. There a Chinese traveller describes life in London. You would remember the essays of Addison and Steele, the spectator and the tattler. Then you would remember the essays of Dr. Johnson, the rambler essays. And in these essays, Johnson discovered a great writer, which Goldsmith definitely was. If you look at his poetry, you would find that Johnson, uh, Oliver Goldsmith, was not just a great poet, the man who wrote The Deserted Village and The Traveller. He created immortal characters in She Stoops to Conquer and The Good-Natured Man, the two plays that he wrote, and The Vicar of Wakefield, which would remain a novel of great fame forever. All of us remember the cad that Marlowe is in She Stoops to Conquer, the hard castles, husband and wife, and Tony Lumpkin, their son. We also remember Dr. Primrose, probably the pastor in the deserted village and Dr. Primrose in the Vicar of Wakefield were modeled by Goldsmith after his father. Apart from Thomas Gray, and Oliver Goldsmith, we must also discover poets such as William Blake, Robert Burns and, and Cooper. We would discuss them in a lecture on some other occasions. Thank you.